Twitter gate. I'm sure you have seen the headlines. I'm sure you have seen a ton of spin. Most people have not taken the time to actually read through the reporting of the story because it's very, very long and somewhat intricate. I won't bore you with all of the details. I will give you the highlights though, because this is at least as corrupt as we all thought it was. And in some ways it seems much more so. Twitter was conspiring with the libs to rig the platform, which is in many ways the new public square for the libs and against the Republicans which is a big deal because we at least notionally have a self-governing republic. So whoever controls the public square controls the political order. Because the way the political order works is that we all persuade one another of how we want to live in the public square. So Twitter is not just some tech platform. It's not just some app that we doom scroll on. Twitter represents, well, it represents the American political order. It represents the way that we speak to one another and persuade one another. And Twitter colluded with the libs to rig it and exclude the conservatives. Uh, Matt Tybee is a liberal journalist. He's a guy who's got bylines and all sorts of lib outlets, but he's become disillusioned with some of the liberal journalists in recent years. And so he's the guy that Elon seems to have picked to give this story to. And he says, hey, here are the docs. Run with it, Matt Tybee. Do your thing. So we see from the very beginning that the Biden team uh, by 2020 was regularly requesting that Twitter take down tweets that they didn't like. So they would just send emails in and say, hey, there's more to review from the Biden team. We don't like this tweet. We don't like that tweet. We don't like this tweet. We don't like that tweet. And it just random accounts, sometimes politically minded accounts, sometimes the accounts of, of regular actors, Hollywood celebrities. James Woods in particular was targeted. So the, the actor, uh, James Woods, you know, one of the greatest tweeters of all time, he had his account targeted by the DNC. They said an additional report from the DNC. Take down this stupid James Woods tweet. James Woods is now threatening to sue over this. Uh, but but you, you see, why would they go after James Woods or other people like that? Because they had huge accounts and the those accounts were going after the Biden team. So they say, take it down. Okay. Now, how, how were the takedowns being done? The Republicans would sometimes request to take things down as well. The problem is there was no neutral system. There was no formal system at all for this to take place. It's, it was just kind of based on who you know. So if you knew somebody at Twitter, you could email them and say, hey, Uncle Joe doesn't really like that tweet. Let's get rid of it, okay? Hey, I don't like what James Wood said. Take that down. And they would do it. Meanwhile, the Republicans say, hey, guys, come on. You're, we're getting death threats over here. People, take down this tweet. But it would be like howling into the wind because nobody at Twitter likes the Republicans. And, and you can see this based on the political donations of the people at Twitter, if you look at open secrets, the donations are just all to Democrats. In the 2022 cycle, the donations from Twitter to Democrats came to $166,000. The donations from Twitter to Republicans, $451. Not $451,000, $451. That means that the percentage to Dems was 99.73%. 2020 cycle, 98.47% of donations to Democrats. The 2018 cycle, 96.38% of donations to Democrats. So not only were the were the Twitter employees statistically all giving to Democrats, but or all of the do- donations were going to Democrats, but it was actually getting worse over time. It was skewing even more toward the Democrats over time. So no surprise that the Republicans couldn't, couldn't get the posts that they wanted taken down. Democrats almost always did. Then you get to the Hunter Biden laptop story. So this was a story broken by the New York Post that they found this laptop from Hunter Biden that had a ton of evidence of crimes not just drug crimes, not just sex crimes being committed by Hunter Biden, but potential political and financial crimes being committed by Hunter Biden on behalf of the Biden family, trading on Joe Biden's name while Joe Biden was the point man to Ukraine, for instance, scoring crooked deals in Ukraine, trading on the Biden name while Biden was serving at the highest levels of the government to get money out of China, getting meetings arranged between between these extremely corrupt actors all around the world and Joe Biden, Hunter's the nexus of that. What happens? Twitter says you can't share this story. Not only does Twitter say you can't post the story publicly, and then Facebook and Google followed suit, but they say you couldn't even privately message the story. So this this step, which says you can't even privately message something, was previously a, a mechanism 
reserved only for child pornography. And it's true, actually, that on Hunter Biden's laptop, there was, it would appear to be some evidence of pornography where the girls didn't totally look 18. Uh, but that's, that's not the point here. We're, we're not talking about the actual contents of Hunter Biden's laptop. We're talking about a story in the New York Post. So obviously there's no child pornography in the story. They just went as far as they possibly could. They said, this material is unsafe. So now we're going to have a new category. It's a category of content that is so dangerous that it involves child pornography or something that threatens the Biden campaign. That's it. That's, that is now the most extreme category on Twitter. The executives almost immediately start, start raising questions about this. The public policy executive, Carolyn Strom, sends an email out to, to several people on the team saying, uh, hey guys, are you sure about this? <laughs> are, you, are we sure that this is, this is really uh, something that, that should be banned from the public platform and such that you can't privately message it. And what Tybee found out is there was a big tension between the communications and policy teams, uh, which had basically no control over moderation, and the safety and trust teams. And those were the ones who were censoring everybody and ultimately who would even censor the duly elected sitting president of the United States. The, The next claim that was made by these guys is that it was a hacked material. So because, okay, forget about, yeah, it's obviously not child pornography, but it's very possibly hacked materials. And so we can't allow that to be uh, spread all around the, the internet. Again, this doesn't hold up at all. You're seeing, uh, you're seeing messages from these top execs saying, are you sure? Is this, is this really going to, to hold up? It doesn't really make a lot of sense to us. Then the crazy part is Jack Dorsey, who was the CEO of Twitter, apparently had no idea what was going on. He was not the guy who made the call to censor the Hunter Biden story. He, he was, uh, I think, away from the office at this point. So that call was made by the uh, former head of legal policy and trust, Vijaya Gaddy, who Elon Musk nuked from orbit on his first day in office. Everybody knew that this was messed up. This is, I think, the biggest revelation from the Twitter internal emails is we've just been gaslit this whole time. And Twitter and big tech, they say, no, of course, this is totally fine. This is in keeping with our policy. There's nothing wrong here. Deny till you die, deny till you die. You look at those internal emails. There, there is a ton of controversy here and people are saying, gosh, this is really bad. We have screwed up. It's not going to hold up, but we can't back away now. We've got to stand firm. You see the former trust and safety chief of Twitter, Yoel Roth, who is getting into these exchanges with Vijaya Gaddy and all these people. And then you got a communications official, Trenton Kennedy at, at Twitter, who says, I'm struggling to understand the policy basis for marking this as unsafe. And then the, the other team basically says, well, just shut up and deal with it. Everybody knew it. There was even a Democrat. There was only one Democrat, but there was a Democrat member of Congress who knew that this was a big deal. That was Ro Khanna, who writes to Vijaya Gaddy, the, the, this lady who's who's taking all the steps to ban people and uh, ultimately would ban Donald Trump and says, hope you're well, Vijaya. This seems a violation of the First Amendment principles. If there is a hack of classified information or other information that could expose a serious war crime and the New York Times was to publish it, I think the New York Times should have that right. A journalist should not be held accountable for the illegal actions of the source unless they actively aided the hack. So you've got this, this lone Democrat out there saying, guys, what about the First Amendment? Even if this were hacked material, which it's not, by the way, still, you can't just ban it from, from being circulated. By the way, you allow pub- the publication of all sorts of Republican hacked material, material that, that was hacked that does not bode well for Republicans on your platform. It, it just, this doesn't hold up. And yet even the Democrat admitting it. So then what happens? Then what happens? What happens is the journalists take stock of their failures, right? The journalists, this took two years. This shouldn't have taken two years. The journalists, they come together, right? And they say, gosh, we did not investigate this huge abuse of power. We, gosh, we did not, we did not speak truth to power as we are supposed to do. And, and they, they, they looked inside themselves and they were very introspective. And just kidding, they didn't say that at all. They actually just kept shilling on behalf of the Democrats and they went after Matt Tyvee. <laughs> so you've got all these liberal journalists turning on their liberal journalist friend for doing the job of a journalist, or at least the, the ideal job of a journalist. In reality, journalists are pretty much just propagandists for a particular point of view. They're not neutral. They are not merely speaking truth to power. That has never been the case ever in the whole history of journalism. 
but uh, with the exception of maybe some independent people who have their own axe to grind usually as well. But you see the, the complete mask fall down by the liberal journos in reaction to Matt Tybee, who say, hey, wait a second. You're not so, supposed to expose the real power structures. Wajahat Ali, he is a liberal journalist, very prominent on Twitter. He's been at all sorts of outlets. He says, Matt Tybee, what a sad, disgraceful downfall. I swear, kids, he did good work back in the day. Should be a cautionary tale for everyone. Selling your soul for the richest white nationalist on earth. Well, he'll eat well for the rest of his life, I guess. But is it worth it? And I, I read that, and I actually didn't get it at first. I said, the richest white nationalist. Who is the richest white nationalist? I realize he's referring to Elon Musk. Is, El is Elon Musk a white nationalist? I guess he's white, although he is an African-American, so that complicates things. But I guess he's white. Is Elon Musk even a nationalist? I don't know that he's a nationalist. I see, I see no evidence that he's a nationalist. And, and it made me realize the term white nationalism, that's just the new meaningless phrase that the libs throw around. It's just the new racism. They, the, the libs used to call everyone that they didn't like racist. And if that, the word racist ever had any meaning, it certainly doesn't anymore. No one cares at all. When a liberal calls you a racist, you know you've won the argument. It's just, it, it has no effect in the public square. It used to be the worst thing you could possibly be called. Now I think it's really losing steam because it's so silly. So, so they have to up the, the ante. And so the, the new one is white nationalist. He's a white, but I, I don't see, even if I'm being as charitable as I possibly can to the left-wing point of view, I don't see how you could possibly describe, I don't, I, I, I don't, I can't even make fun of it. I don't even know what this guy would be talking about to call Elon Musk a white nationalist. So that's just completely meaningless. And then, then what's the second church? What's this rich person? You're just selling out Matt Tybee for the rich person. This was a, a comment that was also underlined by uh, NBC's Ben Collins, who says, imagine throwing it all away to do PR work for the richest person in the world, humiliating SHIT. Who do these people work for? Who does Ben Collins work for? Ben Collins, does he work for the Little Sisters of the Poor? That's who he does. Is this, no, he gets his check from NBC Universal, <laughs> a very, very rich, powerful company. And he gets his check from uh, the, all these guys, Wajahat Ali, all the rest of them. They get their checks, they get their funding, they at, le at the very least, they serve the interests of people who collectively are much, much richer than Elon Musk. Elon Musk is very rich. He's one guy. The people who run NBC, just think, just GE, right? Or just think of any of these corporations that own the media companies. And think about the water that these, even the so-called independent journalists carry for the wealthiest people on earth, for people like George Soros, the largest donor to Democrat causes in the country. It's, it's just preposterous. PR, doing PR work for the richest person in the world. All journalism has a little touch of PR to it because all journalism has spin because all journalism has a perspective because the only people who go into journalism are people who have perspectives about things. And frankly, everybody has a kind of perspective about things because we're rational creatures and we have moral judgment. So obviously that's the case. And when we talk about journalism, journalism is very expensive. It's funded by people. It's funded by people for a reason, to advance a certain view of the world. Daily Wire, we put, I mean, we're, we're self-funded in the sense that we've run our business from basic, almost from day one, you know, from about a year and a half in on cash. And we've done it because of you. Well, why do we, why do we do it because of you? Because we all share a sort of view of the world and we share some basic principles like uh, countries should have borders, kids should not have their genitals chopped off, babies shouldn't be killed in the womb, M many other points of view that we all share together, and then you are willing to spend your money to help us get the message out there. And, and when we're talking about the corporate media, you've got corporations spending a ton of money on media because they know that it's important to have a bullhorn in public. So they're all to some degree PR people. They're all to some degree propagandists. The question is, on behalf of whom and on behalf of what? And when I see these guys, NBC and Wajahat Ali and all the rest of them, just whining and pulling their hair out over the publication of this story, 
It should ask you, it should, well, it should expose, I think, quite clearly who's really serving the powerful entrenched interests. You have the entire corporate media and the entire liberal establishment on one side trying to suppress this story. And then you've got one journalist and one rich guy on the other side exposing it. A rich guy who is so incensed by this kind of behavior that he spent $44 billion to expose it. <laughs> so money well spent, especially especially since it's not, it's not my money. You know, the rest of the show continues now. All right. And this is a music Monday, baby. I told the guys, I said, no more rap. Okay. We've done enough rap. Let's hold off on the rap for a little bit. Or I've had, I've had enough. So they're, they're, they're going to take me back to the nineties. They're going to take me back to the nineties and early two thousands by playing a little alternative rock. Okay. So I'm going to bleach my tips in between now and the members block. I'm going to get out some nice quicksilver and billabong clothing, throw out, throw out a skateboard, and meet you guys over at the member block. If you're not a member, click the link in the description and join us. Mm-hmm.